Hey everybody, this is AP Macro 2016 FRQ, question three. Let's get to it. It says the following shows the number of donuts and cupcakes that John and Erica can each produce in one day. There's the table right there. Here's one thing I want students to know right from the beginning, guys. There's two types of comparative advantage problems, and that's what this is going to be. It's going to be a trade, i.e. comparative advantage problem. One type of problem is an input problem. An input problem is a situation where the outputs are constant and the inputs are varying. That's what an input problem is. The other one is an output problem. With an output problem, the inputs are constant and the outputs are varying, okay? This is an output problem, which is the more typical problem, and I think a little bit easier to solve, okay? With all that said, let's get to it. A, who has the absolute advantage in producing donuts? Explain. We go to our table, basically absolute advantage is just like who's better, okay? So given one day, who can make more donuts? And that is John. So we say John's got the absolute advantage. Our explanation can just be, given the same amount of time, i.e., in one day, John can make more than Erica. I like to use the word resources, so for me, the way I write the explanation is, John can produce more given the same amount of resources. That's the key. And again, the resource in this example is one day. It's time. B, who has the comparative advantage in producing donuts? Explain all right, the comparative advantage, we need to know what that's based on, and that's based on opportunity cost. It's based on who has the lowest opportunity cost. So we need to calculate opportunity cost. So the good thing about an output problem is they've pretty much done all the work for us, right? We think about John here, so I'm going to write John. His opportunity cost is 200 donuts, 100 cupcakes. Okay, I'm going to put a, a, a negative sign in. You can put that negative in either place. The way I've got it written is when he makes 100 um, cupcakes, he gives up 200 donuts. I can just drop that negative over here, but, and I can say, hey, when John makes 200 donuts, he gives up 100 cupcakes. I've got opportunity cost. Now, again, I want to figure this out for donuts. What I want to get this in terms of is one donut, all right? So how am I going to do that? I'm going to divide both of these by 200, right? By the numerator and the denominator by 200, I'm just doing proportions, right? So 200 divided by 200, I've got one donut, and that's what I wanted this in terms of. 100 divided by 200 is 0 0.5, 0 0.5 cupcakes. So when John makes one donut, he gives up. It costs him 0.5 cupcakes. As for Erica, all right, we've got Erica. Uh, I got 150 donuts, so 150 donuts over 50 cupcakes, all right. By the way, that is opportunity cost, but I just want to get it in terms of one donut to make it really easy, easy to compare back and forth. So what am I going to do? I'm going to divide both of these by 150. 150 when I say both of these, we're talking about the numerator and the denominator, right? Just doing proportions here. 150 by 150 is one donut. 50 divided by 150 is one third, so I can put 0.3333, or I can just put one third. If I put a decimal here, I'm going to put 0.33 cupcakes. Who has the comparative advantage? It's the one with the lowest opportunity cost, the one that gives up the least. Guys, that's Erica. So Erica has it for donuts. When she makes donuts, her cost of making a donut is less than John's cost. Erica's got it for donuts. Um, the explanation is, you know, I'm just going to use the term opportunity cost, right? When Erica makes donuts, her opportunity cost is less than John. Now you can actually use the numbers. It's never bad to use the numbers. So I'm definitely throwing in that term opportunity cost. Again, absolute advantage, absolute advantage. I like to use the word resources, comparative advantage. I definitely want to use the term opportunity cost. C. Assume that John and Erica decide to specialize according to their comparative advantages, and that one cupcake is exchanged for four donuts. Okay, so we do a little bit of work here because they're going to want us to know like who, who is this good for, all right? So they got one cupcake being exchanged for four donuts. So what I want to do is I want to first get my opportunity cost for both of them in terms of one cupcake. So how am I going to do that? Well, up here, I'm going to divide them both by 100, right? When I say both, again, numerator and denominator. So if I divide both of these by 100, now I've got it in terms of one cupcake. What are we giving up? 200 divided by 100 is two, two donuts. Okay, when John makes one cupcake, he gives up two donuts. Erica, all right, divide both of these by 50. Again, I want to get this in terms of one cupcake. So I'm going to write one cupcake, the negative sign, because 50 divided by 50 is one, so 150 divided by 50 is three. I'm going to write three donuts. Okay, I'm going to use this right here to go ahead and build out my 
a range of mutually beneficial trade terms, okay? So, I want to give us in terms of cupcakes. I'm going to write one cupcake. Who's going to be the seller of cupcakes? That's the one with the comparative advantage with the lowest opportunity cost when they make cupcakes. And who is that? That's John. I'm going to write John right here. And then I'm going to say buyer. Of course, that's going to be Erica. All right. So now I'm going to write this little range. Again, I'm finding the range of mutually beneficial trade terms. So there, I'm going to write inequality signs. I'm going to put a little blank for a number if that goes right there. I'm going to put donuts. I'm going to put a blank. Donuts, guys, that's going to actually be the terms of trade. We know what that's going to be. So they're saying four. Let's see if that actually works out, though, okay? Might have to erase that because it might not work out once we figure this out. Blank donuts, okay? John's going to want to get a price that is greater than his opportunity cost. What was his opportunity cost? It was two donuts. John wants a price, a terms of trade. That's what a terms of trade is. That's greater than two donuts. Guys, he's going to like this. He's going to want to specialize in trade. So when it comes to John, C1 indicate whether or not specialization trade are beneficial to John, they are. Okay, so we've got that. Four donuts is greater than two donuts. Now let's do Erica, okay? Erica, what are we going to put here? Her opportunity cost, okay? Remember, she's buying, she's buying the cupcakes, right? She wants that price to be less than three for it to be beneficial. Four is not. So I got to just get rid of it. It's not going to work. It's not going to be a, it's not going to be a, a mutually beneficial terms of trade. Guys, who's not going to like for Erica? That price is too high for that buyer, right? So we're going to write no good for Erica. D, assume that Erica discovers a new, uh, a new cupcake production technology. And guys, it's just something about um, just going with economic growth right here. New production technology causes economic growth. That will increase the daily production of cupcakes only using a uh, donuts on the horizontal axis and uh, draw a correctly labeled production possibility curve for Erica before and after the technological change. All right, so we got to do a PPA. Now, here's an interesting thing about this PPF, y'all. Generally, in a macroeconomics class, we're showing PPS for an entire country, and I like to definitely emphasize that PPS for a country, unless otherwise stated, should be drawn concave to the origin or bowed out. So, guys, I got John and Eric. I don't have a country, okay? And the next thing that's also important is I need to think about the resource. The resource was time. That is a 100% adaptable resource, okay? It's equally good at being used to make both goods. So what that gives us is a constant opportunity cost. So I'm actually going to draw a linear line. Okay, see they wanted donuts down here on the horizontal. That makes cupcakes go to over here. Again, I'm drawing a production possibility frontier. The production possibility frontier has production of goods on both axes. What was the original setup? Again, I'm doing this for Erica. It was 150 donuts, and it really doesn't matter where I put it, okay? It was 150 donuts, and it was uh, 50 cupcakes. So let's put 50 cupcakes. These two axes actually don't have to be calibrated the same, so it doesn't really matter where I put those two things. I'm going to draw a line that connects them. Again, my line is going to be linear. There we go. 50 and 150, that's the original PPF. Now, she's able to make more cupcakes only with this production technology than do anything for donut production. And what is she going to be able to make now? I think it's um, production, draw correctly. I'm not sure if it actually said the amount, so we're just going to say more, right? So cupcakes using, da, 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 da. I don't see it, so I don't know. It doesn't even matter, so just the amount's right, 100. Here's the big thing. Maybe I should even write the number. It doesn't really matter. So this is my old PPF. This is my new PPF. All right. So guys, that is economic growth. It's you know it's not economic growth in regards to both goods, but hey, she can now produce more of both. Right. She can go from say a dot right there to a dot right there, which is more of both. That's how we would draw that PPF. Hope that made sense to you. We'll see you in the next video.